My name is James Gordon. I was born in 1965 in a beautiful and vibrant city, a winter city, and a hockey city, Montreal. I grew up in the 70s when Montreal was the most vibrant city in Canada, most exciting metropolis. Winter was still normal, and the Montreal Canadiens were the best hockey team in the world. I was a sports crazed kid who loved the outdoors and being part of a legendary sports dynasty during an incredibly dynamic period for Montreal. As a kid, it was easy and exciting to be a hockey fan because you had the best team and everyone else was a fan too. I was part of the tribe. Go Habs, go. Allez Montréal. Our identity in life is shaped in no small part by our childhood, our surroundings, our activities, and the important people in our lives. I'm no exception to this, and these influences are still important to me because they are at my core. They're in my bones. Hockey in Montreal is sometimes described as a religion. The Montreal Canadiens in the 1970s won the uh, Holy Grail of hockey, the Stanley Cup, six times. I grew up 10 blocks from one of the holiest shrines of hockey, the Montreal Forum, and went three times to one of the holiest of ceremonies, the Stanley Cup Parade. I was a willing disciple in the Church of Montreal Hockey. Like much of Canada, Montreal is a true winter place. Growing up, there was lots of snow, ice, and wind, and it could get really cold. It sometimes felt like winter lasted half the year, but as a kid who loved playing outside, I thought it was great. Winter was a magical time of the year. Besides hockey, I loved skiing, tobogganing, snowball fights, building forts, and just jumping off garage roofs into deep, fresh snow. But my favorite thing was to play outdoor hockey at the neighborhood rink with my best friend, Jeff. I would gobble down dinner, race out the backyard to his house, and we'd walk the three blocks to the local park. We'd play for hours under the lights and the falling snow. We would always hope for a game of pickup or shinny, which is just you make up two teams with whoever was there, but sometimes we just play other games like tag or keep away or just practice your shot. It was a time to prove yourself to the other kids and just have fun. But there was a code amongst us kids, and it went like this. Anyone was welcome to play. Didn't matter your age or ability. All that mattered was that you wanted to play. And we would play for as long as we could until one of only three things happened. Either they turned out the lights, you'd have to get home or else you'd get in trouble with your parents, or your toes would freeze. For anyone who hasn't experienced frozen toes, it's worth describing so that I can make a point. First of all, it's usually just with little kids. Second, when it's really cold, it's sometimes hard to avoid because you just can't fit that many socks into your skates. Next, you don't really notice your toes are freezing until you're, because you're having so much fun playing hockey until it's too late, and then they're actually frozen, and then they start to hurt. But the real hurting only happens when they thaw out, and then you start crying. I remember when I was about seven and crying for about 10 minutes because they hurt so bad, just like little daggers and pins and needles. The last part about frozen toes that's worth mentioning is that, and what separated the kids who really loved outdoor hockey from all the others, is that despite the pain and the tears, you would do the whole thing over again the next night because you had so much fun. And the point I want to make is that I was one of those kids. And there's lots of them all over Canada. I loved everything about outdoor hockey so much, my identity was so wrapped up with it that I would go back for another night of frozen toes. My first volunteer environmental campaign was in 1987 when I helped set up my university's first paper recycling program. Many other campaigns followed since then, but it was only 20 years later that I finally decided I wanted to work full-time in the environmental sector to really try to make a difference. And two things brought me to that decision. First, I read a groundbreaking climate change book, and second, I overheard a conversation between my two young sons. Leading up to both of these, I had been paying attention to climate change and knew it was a serious problem, but it wasn't until 2006 when I read The Weathermakers and saw 
the critical climate change documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, that my eyes were opened very wide to the seriousness of the dangers that lay ahead. The talk between my two sons struck me so hard that I wrote it down right away, later that same year. Angus, I would want to go to the future, age, nine, age seven. Sam, age nine, it's probably going to be a barren wasteland. Me, Sammy, I'm curious why you'd say that. Sam, because we're killing the earth. Sam was and still is very bright and well-read, but how could he, at age nine, perceive things to be so bad that he would say this? As a father of young children, I felt totally distraught about the future and felt that I had to try to do what I could to change the world. Not long after, in 2008, I enrolled in a master's program of environmental education and communication. <laughs> the first year was excellent, but often very sobering, as I learned about ecosystems degradation, plastics pollution, ocean acidification, and on and on and on and on. But it was the subsequent two years of research and writing on outdoor hockey and climate change for my thesis that I'm going to speak to you mostly now about now. First of all, the facts. We are losing outdoor hockey in Canada. These headlines from the last decade tell the story. Sorry about the size. Um, the season is getting shorter. It's typically starting later, finishing earlier. Sorry, st starting later, finishing. <laughs> what is it? Starting later, finishing earlier and with more warm spells in between. In Kamloops, in the winter, as far as I'm concerned, it's not really cold until it's at least in the double digits, minus 10. Then it's cold. I analyzed temperature data for Kamloops for the last 100 years, for the months of December, January, February, and for the first 50 years, from 1919 to 1969, there were 14 months when the average temperature was minus 10 or colder. For the second 50 years, from 1970 to now, only four. And from 1980 to now, only one, which is in 1993, 26 years ago. Even this past February, which we all thought was so cold, only averaged minus nine, and the entire winter, only minus three. These are Kamloops newspaper clippings from January 2010 and December 2018, in the heart of the winter. Outdoor hockey is a canary in the coal mine of climate change. It is a warning of more significant problems to come if we're not care careful. If we lost outdoor hockey tomorrow, several northern nations would mourn it, but in the global scheme of things, it would hardly get noticed. But it is a warning. When I finished my master's thesis and program in 2011, much of Canada, many Canadians, were not that concerned with the effects of climate change. It was distressing to hear about hungry polar bears and crazy storms and flooding of faraway sh shorelines, but for the most part, Canada seemed mostly immune to any serious ill effects. A decade later, however, and the losses are starting to mount. In BC alone, we are losing forests to intense fires and insect infestations, salmon species to warming rivers, mountain glaciers to lack of snow, and we are even losing August, which is now referred to as forest fire season. Around the world, due to, not, due to now inhospitable lands caused by climate change, we have climate refugees from the Northern Africa and the Middle East, entire island nations begging the world to have mercy on them, and what really breaks my heart, countless species on the verge of extinction. And the crazy weather events are just getting crazier. These are trying times. And yet, despite the overwhelming evidence of the dangers of climate change, many of us, myself included, do not do nearly enough to combat against its losses. Why is this? Why are we all not doing more? The simple answer, as one of the authors from my research stated, is that to a greater or lesser degree, we are all climate deniers. The reasons for this denial are very complex, but I'll try to share a few things I've learned 
in the hopes that they will help us all overcome this denial so that we can get engaged in stronger climate change action, which needs both mitigation and adaptation and needs it now. One of the overarching obstacles to dealing with climate change is that it is fundamentally such a big problem. It's, it's sometimes hard to know, well, like, just like other times in history, it, sorry, it's fundamentally such a big problem. It can threaten our sense in our faith in a normal tomorrow. As another author stated, states, the enormity of what is passing away is almost unspeakable. It's not just species and ecosystem systems, but entire cultures, the seasons, civilization itself. Like other times in history that have experienced massive change, it's hard to know how to cope with such change. It's hard to know where to seek solutions. To use a hockey analogy, it's a game changer. I'd like to share what I've learned about combating climate change. I still have a lot to learn on this front, but I believe the following four ideas uh, can help in this fight and are worth sharing. First idea, and to continue with the hockey analogies, keep your head up, which means pay attention. Like hockey, climate change is going to be rough, so you better keep your head up, look where you're going, or else you're going to get hit hard. Seek the truth about climate change. As another author states, when we pretend we don't know, we make ourselves powerless. When we turn a blind eye, we deny the best of ourselves which is our capacity to respond. This is not the time for willful blindness. We all must do a better job to get our hand, heads out of the sand and do what we can to learn about the facts and the real facts. There are dark forces at play that have worked very hard over the years to confuse the facts about climate change for the simple reason that doing so keeps some people rich and in power. So make sure you pay attention to trusted and credible sources. And paying attention also means talking about climate change. Doing so will make it more familiar and less ominous. And having these, these discussions will often be uh, difficult because they're important but don't ignore the tough stuff. Bring it out of the closet. And talking also often leads to action, and we need action. We need lots of action. Second idea, play as a team. We need to stick together and play as a team if we hope to overcome climate change. We can't do it alone. We need to support each other. We need all sorts of solutions, so we need all sorts of people. We are a social species, so working together not only helps to spread the work around, but makes the whole process more enjoyable. Get involved in a climate change campaign or group or start your own. Be a leader or help where you, where, where you can. Uh, although it's been said many times before, it's always worth repeating when we're faced with such a huge challenge as Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Third idea, have a game plan. And this does not have to be complex. Dealing with climate change can sometimes feel like an impossible task because it's so big and you, be, you can become emotionally numb to it. One idea to try to get away from that numbness is a simple solution that I've laid out here. Get together with others for support. Tackle an achievable and I would like to add ambitious goal and repeat with a new goal. Achieving these goals will also help to solidify good habits, which are so important. For instance, if you have a goal of only using your travel mug when you go get a coffee, but at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, you forgot your mug because you're rushing out the door to get your kid to the dreaded 7 a.m. hockey game, then don't get your coffee in a paper cup. Even if you really, really want it, stick with your goal and avoid the convenience of the paper cup, and doing so will make you want to change your systems, figure out a system to remember your mug the next time. So stick with your goal. You can do it. When adopting environmental behaviors, 
It's good to be cognizant of a phenomenon called the single action bias, which basically means when you take on some environmental behaviors, but then don't really do much more because your guilty conscience has been comforted. For instance, if you're just picking the low hanging fruit and you, you know, do your recycling and you change out your bulbs for LED bulbs, but then you don't really do anything else, well, the net effect towards combating climate change is gonna be marginal. To combat against the single action bias, use an environmental checklist. And there's lots of examples out there. And these will help you with incremental steps and a diversified approach that leads to strong energy saving actions. Finally, regarding goal setting and getting involved in climate change campaigns, it's always worth uh, stating that re research points to the fact that many fall flat because of the emphasis on trying to get people to change their behaviors by appealing to their intellect, to the facts and the figures. There's a way better chance of getting people to change their actions when you appeal to the head and the heart. Combine the two together. Emotions matter just as much. And the fourth and final idea, be a character player. This is one of hockey's all-time greatest compliments, and it means you play with passion and you do what's best for your team. And in the context of climate change, being a team player means that you do it the best things for your family, your friends, your community, but most importantly, because climate change is gonna be with us for a very long time, do it for your kids, and all of the kids that are gonna follow after them. So, here's my game plan. And I'm gonna need lots of help with it. Lots of teammates. So if you wanna get involved with this project, please let me know. It's called Shinny Forever. Shinny, also called outdoor hockey, holds a special place in the history of Canada and in the hearts of many Canadians. It brings people together. It is a cherished winter pastime, and hockey is often described by many Canadians as Canada's game. Yet Shinny, this beloved tradition, is literally melting away due to climate change, and future predictions are not looking good. As a father, I've seen this beautiful activity be threatened for current and future generations of kids, so I've decided that I'm gonna to try to do something about it. So, I'm putting together a team, and we're gonna hit the road on the ultimate carbon neutral Canadian winter hockey road trip. We're starting from my hometown of Kamloops in late December 2020, and we're gonna travel for 10 weeks to every province and territory, and play shinny, celebrate shinny, and then uh, every day, and then after the games, we're going to have conversations about Shinny, about possible solutions to climate change, and, um, possible solutions to climate change, and the, the more serious effects that communities are dealing with because of climate change. There will also be a significant hockey rink building project using climate, uh, building climate positive outdoor rinks. Also, the entire trip will be filmed with the intention of later turning it into a web series or documentary. From Kamloops, we'll go through BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario to have a national Shinny game in Ottawa. Then it's on to Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and finally fly to Nunavut, the Northwest Territories, the Yukon, and then back to BC where the final game will be back in Kamloops in early March 2021. Again, we will offset all the carbon from the trip. To appeal to a broad audience, there will be a social media campaign, contests to play in the Shinny Games, educational components in the school, and presentations on climate change in Canada and around the world. As I said, there will be um, a major project to build outdoor climate positive community hockey rinks. I believe that in order to help Canadians adapt to and learn about climate change and to keep on playing this beautiful game that, not that I believe, I'm planning on it, to raise $700,000 so that any municipality can submit a proposal for a $50,000 grant. And these grants will be used to study 
how to build and maintain a climate positive rink, which means it will produce more energy using renewable energy sources than it needs. 14 grants will be available, one for each province and territory, plus one for the nation's capital, and the best proposals will win. The proposals will also need to include how to educate the public about all of the renewable energy systems used for the rink, for instance, with a demonstration site, a test center, or an information kiosk. I will also researchers before, during, and after the whole thing to look at a variety of climate change issues with the intention that findings will help inform government and public policy. Finally, I'm taking steps right now to start a nonprofit registered society called the Canadian Outdoor Skating and Hockey Association so that there will always be shinny forever. Thank you. <laughs>